Good morning, everybody. We'll get started then. Thanks, everybody who came in person today and who is here online. For the people in the room, this is a little difficult for me because I like to wander, but there's a microphone, so I'm trapped right here. So my name is Jennifer Bombush, and I'm being here at the School of Nursing. Well, it's just past my eight or nine year anniversary. Can't do that math that well. Um, as a um, faculty, and I'm an associate professor here, and my program of research is really centered around improving the inclusion of families in long-term care and in all healthcare settings. So today I'm going to be sharing uh, results from a survey, a province-wide survey that we did around family councils, but it's kind of couched within other aspects of my research program. So I'm going to start uh, just with some acknowledgments of the co-investigators on this study. So Sharon Cohen from SFU, Colin Reed from UBC Okanagan, and Chris White, who is a social work leader at Providence Healthcare, were the co-investigators. And we had a couple of wonderful trainees who learned lots about doing surveys involving hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper, Preet and Isabel. I'm going to start today with a story because at my core, I am a qualitative researcher, but also because this story sort of sets up why my title is From Individual to Collective Advocacy. So this is my grandma, Caroline, and my dog, Howard. And this picture was taken a couple of years ago. And tomorrow actually would have been my grandma's 100th birthday. And she died last year, a few days short of her 99th birthday. And she lived... Um, until her mid-90s in an apartment in the West End of Vancouver, from where she moved into a voluntary nonprofit care facility here in Vancouver. She moved into a private pay bed there and stayed there until her name got to the top of the publicly funded wait list so she could stay in that same space in that care facility from the time she moved in until the time that she died. And during her time there, she received excellent care, and she received excellent end-of-life care. Now, a big part of the reason for that is because our family had been on this journey before. She lived in the same care facility as my other grandma did. She has a granddaughter like me who specializes in long-term care stuff. She has another granddaughter who's a social worker in long-term care. And she's a family that is really involved, but also open and understanding about aging and end of life. And I tell this story because, to me, this is her experience, and she has a family that knows how the system works and knows how to work the system. But I want everybody to, a year later, feel and be able to tell a good story about their experience in long-term care. But the stories I hear from people in my research are stories of trauma. People are entering the system traumatized by what they experience in acute care and oftentimes in the community. Most people are not moving into a long-term care facility from their home. Most are moving in from the hospital or have been in hospital and are home for 24 or 48 hours and then being placed. And most do not have a good end of life care experience. We still have many, many people who live in long-term care who are being transferred in the last days of life to acute care and are dying in acute care. And so I think that, you know, for people like my grandma, we can continue having great experiences and telling good stories. But that's an individual experience. And so what I really want to push today on is, how do we make that a collective experience? And how do we help families to come together and do that collectively so that people aren't isolated, don't feel traumatized, and leave that experience saying, well, I'm never going to think about a long-term care facility again because in 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to be there. And oftentimes in my work with families, they say, family members and family caregivers say to me, well, this won't be like this when I get there. But unless we collectively work towards the difference, that is exactly what it's going to be like when you get there. 
So that's sort of where this story begins. So before I launch into some more of the data and the background, I always have to start with my provisos when I'm talking about family research. So family is always whoever the person says it is. That might not be your biological family. It might be. It might be the staff who work at a facility. It can be lots of different things. And we also need to think about optimal involvement because the thing that's different between families and staff is each family member will choose their level of involvement and that can look wildly different and that's okay. And as paid care providers, we should never be in the space of saying, well, you ought to do this, you should do that, you have to do that. It is an optimal involvement that is decided by that individual family member and by their relative. And we also need to remember that just as individuals grow more diverse with aging, so do families. So for the next little while, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, families in general in our healthcare system, particularly in relation to caring for older adults, and the research around family councils and long-term care. That won't take long because there's about five studies on it. I'll share our family council survey results and get into some recommendations and thinking about what should be the aim of family councils. Because for any presentation I do, there must be an acronym that you can walk away with that you can apply in practice. So when we think about our healthcare system, we often think of nurses as being the biggest workforce in our healthcare system. In fact, families are the biggest workforce in our system. And the other group missing from this slide are unregulated healthcare workers. And I'm pretty sure unregulated healthcare workers are the second biggest bubble on this slide. But we don't know how many there are, and we don't exactly know where they work. And we don't always know exactly what they do. So it's really important to consider, as we're engaging in different projects in the healthcare system, that our two biggest members of our workforce are largely unpaid or underpaid for the type of work that they're doing. And we have huge expectations for these workers. And I talk about families as workers because oftentimes we're expecting family members to do things that are very similar or the same as what a regulated healthcare professional would do for example, in an acute care setting. So we need to really acknowledge that from the get-go, that families are contributing and are involved in mo massive ways in our healthcare system. And part of what our role is as healthcare providers is making sure that we are engaging them in a respectful manner that acknowledges their role in our system. So, this is just a little bit about sort of the philosophical orientation towards family involvement in care in our healthcare system. And I kind of look at it over the arc of my own personal nursing experience that started in the early 1990s. And I have my invisibility cape from Harry Potter on there because I think oftentimes family care work is invisible. And it's assumed that it's happening, but it's very poorly acknowledged. So when I started in nursing, we had something called consumer-driven care, where all of a sudden people were saying, well, I'm not your client, I'm a consumer. And that positioned clients and families in a particular way within the system. So you're here working for me. And then we shifted more into patient and family-centered care, which began more in pediatrics and is becoming more prevalent in adult care. And um, I think we're still mostly there. So if you're looking at the literature or engage with family advocates and uh, patient advocates online, um, we're still kind of at that point of patient and family-centered care, but still have a long way to go. But where patients and families are really pushing and driving is around engagement. And so the definition of engagement is giving patients and families timely, complete, and understandable information, ascertaining patients and families' knowledge and understanding of their and their ill relatives' values, beliefs, and risk tolerance regarding care choices, and giving patients and families encouragement and support, and involving family according to the patient's wishes. So that is uh, very much uh, oriented around the patient and family. It is not about what we can do for you or what you can do for us, but it is intended to be a very dialogic engagement between the patients and families and healthcare providers. And I think that this is the direction that we ought to be moving on in, in long-term care as well. 
So this is the audience participation portion of my presentation, because we're all here nice and early. So this is where I ask you to give stars. So you think about a care facility you might be involved with, or an acute care system that you're involved with, um, and that might be as a patient, a family, or a provider. And for each of the different statements I'm going to say, I'd like for you to think about whether or not these are being enacted where you are and where you're thinking about. So how many stars would your institution or facility get? First of all, have visiting hours been eliminated? Because if we're thinking about engaging with families, are their hours restricted? Or are they allowed to come and go at any time? Is there a family council or family advisory committee? So I'm aware of one of our large institutions here in Vancouver that has a patient-centered care committee and is widely known for its patient and family-centered care. But there are zero patients and families on that committee, which speaks volumes to how they actually enact that in every day. Are there comfortable cots for family members to sleep on if they stay over? Is another question. The next question is, do family members get free parking or do they pay the same as staff? So lots of places I go to, you're paying for parking these days, and visitors sure as heck are paying a lot more than the people who work there. So what does that look like in terms of access? The next question is, is there free Wi-Fi for families? So you have a lot of staff sometimes walking around a facility who can get connected to Wi-Fi, but families and residents can't. And I've had family members in some of my research say to me, it would be so wonderful if we could connect to Wi-Fi because then my mom can FaceTime with their grandchildren in the Maritimes. But they don't have access to FaceTime. The next question is, are care conferences and rounds scheduled around the availability of families or around the convenience of healthcare team members? The next question is, have family members ever written a portion or all of a client or patient's care plan, which the rest of the team then follow? The next question is, do family members actively contribute to documentation on the patient's chart, let alone have easy access to reading it? And the last question that I have that is really based on my family's experience and made a huge difference during the last two or three days of her life is, do you provide food and beverages to family members who sit at vigil while their relative is dying? And I won't ask people to share how many stars they got. Um, but if you don't have a fair number out of those nine questions, I think you really have to ask questions about how much are you engaging with patients and families? So I'm going to be talking about family councils and talking about some of the issues with family councils. But if you don't already have a philosophical and practical orientation towards patient and family engagement, I don't know how you can think that you're going to have a successful family council. So, families in long-term care. For a long time, there's been a myth that families stop providing care when their relative moves into a care facility, but that is not true. Family members remain highly involved most of the time, but guess what? They don't know really what to do when they get there because they're moving from their home, which is their place of control and power, into an institution where they probably don't have a key to the front door. So that's my other question that I didn't put on my list, but that would be number 10. If your front door is locked, do family members have a pass key for it? Or do only staff get a key to the front door? Because at my house and at my parents' house, I have a key to the front door. And anyone who thinks I'm going to let the boogeyman in the front door of the house where my parents live is much mistaken. But we all know that as soon as we start to talk about getting patients or families passcodes for the front door, people freak out because who knows who will come in that building. Horrible, terrible boogeyman will come. So we need to think about that as we're thinking about how home-like are we making these facilities where families continue to provide care. We know that 70% of older adults with dementia will die in this setting and that the amount that families contribute will continue to increase over time. So that isn't changing. So we need to find ways to better engage with families within this setting. 
So when I said there were about five articles about research about family councils in long-term care, I probably fibbed because there might be about four. And so this is a big issue because we have kind of adopted this as a best practice to demonstrate how families are being engaged, but in a very unquestioning way. So if you have a family council, tick a box on accreditation or on licensing, and you're doing something to engage with families. But when we look at the evidence of, are, is this actually a good practice? We don't actually have a way to answer that question. So fortunately, in Ontario, the Change Foundation does excellent work. They support family councils. And in Ontario, um, is the only province right now where family councils are required. And so they're able to do uh, some fairly good and rigorous surveying of their family councils in order to see how they are functioning. And so I've just highlighted sort of um, the area where they see the potential for family councils, and that's around enhancing quality of life for residents, information sharing, and in enhancing the quality of care. They also have an annual conference for family uh, council associate for our family councils where family members can, from all different facilities, come together and be supported to come together at a conference on family leadership, which is not something that we have here in British Columbia. Of the few other studies, other researchers, researchers have also reported that family councils can enhance collaboration with staff and can contribute to collective problem solving. So those are big things. When we think about the things in long-term care that are our goals, we see huge issues with conflict with staff, with families. Um, we see issues around problem solving, and we see issues around the quality of life of residents. So it's very hopeful that potentially family councils could begin to address some of these issues. So in terms of how we define family council for our study, we decided um, because we were sending surveys out around the province that we would use the way that it's described within our own regulations. So we used this from the Community Care and Assisted Living Act here in British Columbia and had this on our survey and asked people, do you have this? And as you can see, um, it's, it's pretty open and pretty flexible. Uh, so really people and facilities that are licensed need to meet or either as a council and provide families to meet as a council or if they don't have a council, meet as a group for the purpose of promoting the collective and individual interests of the persons in care and involving the persons of care in decision making on matters that affect their day-to-day -day living. So it's very broad. It is um, up to the facilities to decide how often and what exactly those family council meetings might entail. And as it says, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a family council, but you might have times when people are invited to come together. So I'm going to share with you now the results from our survey that we did. So the research questions were, what is the prevalence of family councils in British Columbia, and what are the main characteristics of family councils in British Columbia? And these were the methods. Um, obviously, British Columbia was the setting. The participants, so um, we mailed surveys to all of the facilities in the health authorities where we conducted the study. And we basically said, could the director of care please complete the study or their designate? Because sometimes there might be someone else in the facility who's better suited to complete the survey. So that might be a social worker, manager of recreation, or whoever was the leader of the family council. So I think a limitation of this study is that families did not participate. It's a huge limitation, but I think it also gave us the opportunity to get information from people who work at the facilities and are responsible for actually facilitating and having resources to support family councils to complete the survey. We mailed the surveys with a $5 coffee card and did two reminders. And I have to say I'm sold on Dillman's survey method because our response rates were great and that also speaks to the level of engagement of our long-term care community. So for data analysis, and today I'm just presenting some descriptive statistics um, of sort of the places where we were counting information and some content analysis from our open-ended questions. So for our response rate, we had an 86% response rate across the province. Here I'm going to point out to you something about our survey that I think as a researcher is really important. And I know that we have lots of long-term care and organizational leaders on the phone. So this is my plug around research. So we have five geographical health regions in our province. 
we had ethics approval for all of them. And despite several attempts, we were not given operational approval for Northern Health. So this is also a limitation of our study because we would have loved to have a province-wide survey, but we were not given operational approval. So what is operational approval? It means we have research ethics approval, so our study meets the criteria for research ethics, both within our university and within the health authority, but people in leadership positions in the health authority were unwilling to allow us to send a survey to the directors of care at each of their facilities that took about 20 minutes to complete. So it's really important as researchers and organizational leaders that we work together to ensure that our research is as robust as it can be. Because clearly people really wanted to participate in this research. We had response rates between 79 and 93 percent. So that's kind of unheard of and I'm glad Elizabeth Saywick who does lots of this kind of research is nodding her head because Again, this speaks to people want to tell this information and they want to talk about it and have a dialogue about it. And we can only do that when we're doing research that reaches out and um, allows everybody that voice. So we're pretty proud of that piece of this uh, research that we had such a wonderful response rate. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the facility characteristics of those 222 usable surveys that were returned to us. 68% of the participating facilities had a family council, 22% had no family council, and 10% had a joint or resident, uh, joint resident and family council. So it's important to note, first of all, in terms of exclusion criteria for the study, we excluded facilities that um, had a resident population that was uh, the majority of whom were under the age of 65. So those uh, facilities that had no family council still had a majority of residents that were over the age of 65 but didn't have a family council. Other things around the characteristics was that larger facilities are more likely to have a family council and smaller facilities are more likely to have a joint council, which is not surprising if you have less people to draw upon. It makes more sense to have people come together. In terms of ownership and the people who participated in our study, private facilities were actually most likely to have a family council at 80%, as opposed to the owned and operated non-for-profit facilities, which were about um, at 60% in terms of having a family council. And also not surprising was that if you are an accredited facility, you're much more likely to have a family council. So if you're a family member and you're thinking about how much does this facility engage with families, accreditation is a pretty good signal that um, they will have a functioning or at least a family council available for you to be part of. So next I'm going to just um, report on what those family councils, those 49 who said, no, we don't have a family council. This was the main reason they uh, reported for not having a family council. So the first reason was nobody comes. So we had lots of comments like, there's lack of family interest, we've tried in the past, we put a request in the newsletter two times a year. The next reason people don't have a family council is people who come just complain. And they said, we've tried a number of times and the only family that showed up were people who wanted to complain and after made inappropriate remarks about the residents and staff felt very attacked. So they don't have a family council. And the third reason people don't have a family council was it just takes up too much resources, particularly for um, really you're only bringing people together so that no one shows up or people just show up to complain. So that was not worth the staff resources that um, it would take to have a family council. We also had several surveys where people said, I'm new here, I just started as a leader in this facility. We don't have a family council right now, but I'm going to give it a try within the first year that I'm here. Which also speaks to the turnover of leadership in these settings, which is a serious concern. So now I'm going to share the findings from the facilities that reported, yep, we have a family council. So um, we were missing data from a couple of facilities here, but the rest uh, gave us more information about what their council looks like. So typically, family councils are most likely to be held once a month. The meetings are usually held during the week and in the afternoon. No big surprise there. Um, 
you can see that only three facilities made the Family Council available on the weekend. So we think, well, who might be available on the weekend to come, as opposed to who might find it more convenient to have it Monday to Friday in the afternoon before they leave work? Um, and some people alternated, but again, a tiny number alternated between the weekday and the weekend. Um, and again, the time of day varied quite a bit, what was typically in the afternoon and evening. We also asked who chairs the meeting and found that 58% of councils are chaired by a staff person, 29% are chaired by a family member, about one third chaired by a family member, and 11% share chairing duties between staff and family. So we can see the most family councils, ironically, are chaired by staff person. So the next thing we asked about was, how is information about an upcoming family council shared with families? So we asked people to check all that apply. And so you can see that, um, for the most part, that information is posted on site. And by on site, we don't mean a website. We mean like on a bulletin board, you might happen to walk by when you're in the facility, if you actually live close enough to the facility to regularly visit your family member. About 83 of the 149 said they send it by email. Other people send written information other ways, like through a pamphlet or a letter. In-person invitation, 45 people reported in person. So again, that's great. But, okay, I will not admit that I was not at visiting my grandma, perhaps, as much as I could have. But when I sometimes walked into the facility, there was one carrot who would continually often say to me, every time I went in, because he was often working, would say, hey, I haven't seen you forever. Which really made me feel like walking right back out again. So we have issues with people feeling welcome to visit their relative. So if we have to hope that they're on site at a time when someone might mention the family council, because most family members may not be there during the day, during the week, just happen to see the person who might share that information with them, that information may not be getting to them. 17 uh, reported um, sending it out in their newsletter. Only three places said they post information about Family Council in a language other than English. So in British Columbia, particularly in the Lower Mainland, we have a very diverse resident population in terms of language spoken. And so in three cases, people make that information available to families in other languages. And then people reported um, a bunch of different types of other ways that they communicate. Okay, this goes very fast when I hit the button. So then we asked, are there any of the strategies in place to encourage people to make it easier for them? So thinking about accessibility. So most people in this case uh, reported that they send reminders, are posted again on site or sent in the mail. People are reminded in person. Um, they're off in terms of people offering the option to join over the phone in 2017, there are 17 places that reported that they provide access in a way other than is in-person on-site. Offering to have translators present and translating the meetings, there are five uh, sites that reported doing this. Four sites reported offering the option to join by video conference, and one site uh, reported that they provide some financial support for transportation. So if you think about how people get to you, or if you have to pay for parking once you get there, sometimes it's a huge burden for people to participate, and those are the kinds of barriers that there might be. The next thing we asked were, how are the minutes communicated to families who did not attend? So we are really excited about our bulletin boards, clearly in long-term care, because they are posted in a public space in the facility. That was the main way that they're um, presented. 48 places said that they, um, so 48 of 149 reported that they email them to their resident's primary contact person. 15 put them in the mail. Two facilities um, translate their family council minutes into a language other than English. And then we asked, what is the focus of your family council meeting? And so similar to what the Change Foundation found, people are typically providing venues for information sharing, advocacy, education, 
and networking. So those were our counting kinds of questions. And then we had some open-ended questions. And one was about what are the benefits? And so people talked about opportunities to connect with other families and peer support. So this facility reported, family council is a time to network with other family members and educate themselves regarding topics such as dementia, sometimes just to know they aren't alone. And certainly we have found that in other research that we're doing, that that peer connection is so key. Learning opportunities was another benefit, and they said, we have a wide range of guest speakers covering topics from funeral planning, downsizing, adaptive clothing, palliative pain management, violence in the care home, grief and loss, income taxes, music and memory, loneliness, and connection. And another place said, you know, really working towards having constructive attitudes. So we discuss issues and work to problem solve instead of complain. So making sure that the family council doesn't veer off into a complaints kind of uh, forum. So this next people on this slide get my multi-starred slides. These people are a genius. I don't know what facility this is, but here is some long-term care problem solving at its best. I know that once we changed the times from evenings, it made a big difference. Now we have family council after the afternoon happy hour when we usually have a good attendance of family here already, and then they can easily stay for family council instead of coming back specifically just for one event. Brilliant. People are already feeling great after happy hour, and then they just slide into family council and spend some more time together. So I think this is a great example of problem solving and thinking how can we make this work um, and make work, it work best with the families as the focus. So now some of the challenges, very similar to people who just don't have a family council, so a perceived lack of interest. Families show no interest in having a council despite numerous attempts and offers to help set this up. Lack of understanding about family council. There's an image of family council as a place for complaints, but that's not what it is. And consistency of attendance. We are always starting again with families, meaning as their loved one gets more ill, then they tend to drop out. And after the parents of the active family members passed away, there, wasn't, there weren't members who want to be active anymore in the council. So this also speaks to complexity of care and long-term care. So we've gone from not that long ago having people come to live in long-term care facilities for several years to now the average length of stay, which really means until a person passes away is 18 months So, in British Columbia. So people are there for a relatively short period of time. It's very intense and very typically very acute time in their health. So we need to take that into consideration when we're planning something like a family council. So what I think was very positive was that when we had our open-ended question at the end and said, please share any thoughts you have about the family council, and we did a word cloud about this, residents were at the center. So I think that's the most important place to start, that for um, people who are in leadership positions and are trying to have effective family councils, residents are always at the center. And I think for families, that is who is at the center of this as well. So that's my information about what we found out, and I'm going to talk now a little bit about some recommendations that come out of this research. So first of all, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you have a great family council that's running, uh, you know, what I say may or may not be helpful, but if it's working now, it, realize it might not work this way forever, but keep going and doing what you're doing. I have two slides about um, the number of people present. So a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. So when we repeatedly hear from people, not enough people show up to make this worthwhile, my question to them is, how many is enough? I have run lots of groups in my life. I have talked to empty rooms. Um, it is hard when you put a lot of effort into a group and you feel disappointed because two or three people show up, but that doesn't mean it's a failure. But if your goal is, this is only worthwhile, because I've done a cost-benefit analysis, if 15% of you show up, then that's a great goal and figure out how to achieve that goal. But I think to sit back and lamely say, well, not enough people show up, so it's not worth my while, is really pretty unfair to the people who aren't coming. I think we also need to think about the quote that says, I alone can't create the change, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. 
So even if there's two or three people there, you don't always necessarily know how that is creating change. This isn't all measurable. So it's okay if two or three people show up. They might talk to two or three family members the next time they're on site. Um, they might talk to two or three people in their community about what it's like to have an aging family member. That is okay. I think that also can be success. I do a lot of qualitative research and people say to me, like, what's your deliverable? And I have to sit in meetings with people and say, well, I don't know. I don't always know. And that's okay. Like, let's go on this adventure together and see what we can find out. But we may never know. And that is okay. And also, the person who says something is impossible should not interrupt the person who's doing it. Like, if you're doing it, great. Keep going. In Victoria, we actually have... Um, a family-led family council association and wouldn't it be neat to see that spread across the province it is a family-led family-driven group and there are some facilities that actually have a family council that is run by the facility and a family council that is run by families so I think that's a lot of food for thought about how some family activists want to engage in a larger way um, in our work so this is really now getting to the nuts and bolts of things. What is the aim of a family council? So my question to people who are struggling with a successful family council is, if you have a lot of falls happening with your residents, what do you do? If you have people who aren't washing their hands at work, what do you do? If you have a huge and unusual amount of incontinent supplies being used at work and it's breaking your budget, what do you do? Well, you usually could and should start a QI project and maybe a PDSA cycle. So we need to think about, okay, if X number of falls is acceptable in our facility, what is our benchmark for success for our family council and how do we get there? Because if we're just flailing around saying this isn't working without a plan, you're just going to continue to flail around. So the first thing I recommend is get a plan, make a plan, and treat it like you would any other quality improvement project in your facility. And so what is the A of the aim? Is the family council accessible? So one of the things you can do is regularly survey families about when and how council should be run. Most facilities are doing family satisfaction surveys because you want to get accredited and you need data from families. So really think about how you're dipping into your families in order to collect information. And what are you doing and what is the purpose of that? So one of the areas of purpose could be around family councils. So is it accessible? So from the data I showed, family councils are not generally very accessible. So what could you do? Use technology to connect and be connected. What are some of the ways you could do this? Well, you can use teleconferences. You can use webinars. I'm just going to ask Marilee, oh, how many people are online right now? Marilee's just doing a 10. So 10 people are online right now, and I know I saw Sarah Hussein's name pop up, so I know someone is online from Toronto. So that's pretty cool. We're having a pretty big reach right now. We have family members who live all over the province, all over the country, all over the world, who might just want to connect into your family council. Facebook groups. Lots of people are on social media right now. I don't know how many facilities have a Facebook page, and within that Facebook page, you can create a family council group. And does a family council need to be synchronized or non-synchronized? So lots of people, this is going to go online afterwards and can watch it um, whenever they feel like. So does it have to be that we all talk at the same time, or can you have a non-synchronized type of approach to make your family council more accessible? The time of the day of the week, who is the council convenient for? Is it convenient for family members or is it convenient for staff? And of the family members for whom it's convenient, is it mostly convenient for unemployed or retired family members? And advertising. We need to move beyond the bulletin board on site and think really creatively and tweet about it and maybe post about it online or have a Facebook page so that we have multiple ways. We know that People need information many times in many different ways in order for it to stick. Cultural accessibility. How are we thinking about translation and language in meetings to make sure that people 
feel like coming. If you're coming to sit in a room where everybody's speaking rapidly in a language that you have limited or no understanding of, you're not coming. So how do we reach out and make sure that it's accessible for people? And then the costs. And again, we have to think about things like gas, things like parking, and things like taking transit. And even for some of my intervention research, we've had some older family members say, you know, I'm not going to come after dark. I'm not going to be able to do this or that. So how do we think about building costs in? So everything costs something in healthcare, in everything. So are we willing to provide support for people to be able to come? The second part of your aim is, is it informative? So no one wants to come. Family members also don't want to come and sit and listen to a bunch of people complain. Because I hear this at the other end in other research. So regularly survey families about topics of interest. So the good part about having people moving in and out a lot is you can have a pretty finite list and keep it fairly fresh. So you don't have to keep recreating the wheel because every couple years or so you can start your topics again. So these are topics that we've heard from family members in research that we've done about what they want to hear about. They want to know who these alphabet soup people are. The care aide is the person they spend most of the time with, but they go to a care conference with an OT, a PT, a social worker, an MD, maybe an LPN, a pharmacist, an RN, people they've never met and never see, and really they just want the care aide there to talk to about what's happening with the personal laundry. So I think it's a really valuable and important exercise to talk with families about who these different people are and what are their roles. Another topic is meaningful activities with a person with advanced dementia. So oftentimes people are getting support when their relative is still living at home, how to interact with someone with a progressive dementia, what things can you do. But what we heard from families when their relative has a very advanced dementia is, what do we do now? My relative doesn't talk anymore. They don't seem to be interested in any of the activities. So what can we do to make our time meaningful for them and for me? So that's a topic you can do at your family council. And how to make care conferences work for you. So many family members do not find the care conference experience particularly delightful. So I think having a coaching session for family members around family council is an excellent idea, or around care conferences is an excellent idea for family council. The next piece is around staff education equals family education. So we spend a lot of time on new initiatives in British Columbia to teach staff, get staff ready, and yet we have this significant unpaid workforce of family members there who would hugely benefit from knowing what we're talking about if we're talking about pieces or the gentle persuasive approach or nonviolent crisis intervention. When people come to visit, they're not in a bubble. They observe. They know what's going on. They can feel scared when they're surrounded by a group of people with different kinds of dementia or just people who are angry to be there and there's no staff around and what are they supposed to do in that moment? So that family members have told us that's scary. So if you're equipping your paid staff with education, you should be equipping the people who are there but aren't paid to be there with some education too. And having guest experts. So applying the principles of accessibility. If you read a neat article and you think, hey, that person would be awesome to have at my family council, I can almost guarantee you that most researchers, particularly in the age of knowledge translation and public engagement, will be more than happy to join your family council via webinar or in person if they can to talk about the work they're doing. So um, I think a lot of re reaching out to people who are do doing different interesting work in long-term care is something that people could try and do. More ideas. This is my pie in the sky ideas and I really challenge people to really think about doing these things and thinking about where can families have meaningful input. Strategic planning. If you are a nonprofit facility, do your board members go to your family council? Do they talk with those family council members about um, the strategic planning? Do you have a liaison position between your board and your family council? How is that happening? Accreditation. 
giving family members the opportunity to contribute to how you're writing up your accreditation and how you're meeting those criteria is something lots of family members would be quite interested, I think, in doing. And even knowing how accreditation measures areas of excellence around family engagement. Budgeting. How often do you go to your families and present your budget and say, this is the money we get in, this is how it's spent? Did you know this is how much this costs? Do you know that we spend more on incontinent supplies and on staffing here? That's important information. Because when you talk about people coming and complaining, if they're complaining in a vacuum of information, then give them information. If people know that the average meal in long-term care costs less than what it costs an average meal to prepare in prison, gosh, could we get a collective letter writing campaign happening to increase the budget for food for people who live in care facilities? There are lots and lots of issues that family members, I think, would be interested in coming together around collectively, not just within your facility. This isn't a complaint session for your facility, but to lift up that advocacy to the level of the health authority and to the province to say, it is not acceptable that at the end of your life, your meal costs less than it does in prison. Political activism. How often do you invite your MLA or your MP to attend in dialogue with families? The elected officials in your area, lots of facilities have a connection with their local MLA in particular. Do they come to your family council? Or if you have a family meeting once or twice a year, are they your keynote? Do they come and they listen and engage with families? That's really important because those are their constituents. In the most recent Vancouver by-election, nobody in the elections office thought to send people to the care facility so people living in care facilities could vote. That is disgusting. And so we have a whole bunch of people who are living in Vancouver and did not get to participate. And I can tell you from working in long-term care, voting is very key to people's existence. They take it very seriously. So we think about the invisibility of the people that live there, of the facilities themselves, and this is really key. So helping to facilitate that political activism can be a key role. So that's the A and the I. What's the M? Is the family council meaningful? So how are authentic change and transformation realized from coming together? And I think this is the part that's really hard to measure. But I was recently at a meeting where the university brought together everybody who does aging research or invited us all. Um, and the key question that one of the leaders in research kept saying was, like, what's our purpose? What are, we, what are we supposed to come out of this with? And, you know, families, they have the same question. There's a lot of other things on people's plate. There's a lot of other things people could do. If you have a facility and the people who come every day who I call highly involved families, who come every day or multiple times a week, are not at your family council, your family council is not meaningful. And they are finding meaning somewhere else. So if you want to start and think about how do you engage in a better way, you need to go to those people, go to where they are, go to their house if you need to, you know, take them out for coffee at Starbucks, spend a few bucks, and ask them, why aren't you coming to family council? Because the other thing you need to know about those family members is, when the person who visits every few months or very rarely comes, they don't go to talk to your staff. They don't, you probably don't even see them because they come at a time when you might not be there. They are making a beeline for those family members that are there every day. And they're saying, tell me what it's really like here. So they're getting information. Don't fool yourself that they're not. There is an underground information train in every facility and institution that exists. So if you want to be part of it, and you should want to be part of it, as an organizational leader, you need to go to those family members that are there all the time and say, why aren't you at family council? What would make it accessible for you? What kind of information would you like there? And what would make it meaningful? And if you can get them there, then you will have a successful family council. So. That was my entire talk, and I just invite everybody to continue to connect with us at the Jero Research Unit. We have an email address if you want to be getting regular emails from us about events and different things that we're doing, publications and public reports. Just send us an email and we'll put you on our email list. We're active on Twitter, which
which I love. So that's a very fun way to connect. We're also on Facebook now. And we invite everybody to join our Facebook page because we also send out lots of interesting information out that way. And of course, we have our website where you can check out everything that we're doing. Thank you. And I don't know if there's any questions before we wrap up. Marilee's just checking online if anybody has a question. Judy has a great question. She's asked if there are other models besides family councils. So um, there's actually very little research in terms of intervention type research with families in long-term care. I brought up this because this picture is actually from um, our intervention study that we did where we were thinking about how do we make things meaningful for families. So this was our sense intervention. And um, I think that you can see from the faces around the table that we were all in a very meaningful dialogue at the time. This was actually following a two-hour workshop. And everybody was kind of looking at their watch at the end and saying, I have to go, I have to go. And then we had lunch, and everybody stayed for two more hours. And so I think there are different ways to do it. And I think really capitalizing on that idea of information and making sure that your council does not become a complaints forum, but that um, you're providing people with information that is meaningful and then providing an opportunity to meaningfully engage in peer support um, is incredibly helpful because part of the findings from this study that we found was we asked people, has this changed your interactions with family members outside of our workshops? And the majority of them said yes. We're making different kinds of connections. So I do think that is an important piece. The other piece around this was we certainly worked hard to make it co-developed, co-created, and co-led by family members. So I think that idea around the ownership, like I think you can post information on a bulletin board, but it is that person going up to you and saying, I'm going to this, do you want to come to? That is the difference, right? So they're not written down formally or often researched, but I think there are other promising kinds of ways to do this. Yes, Wendy, sorry. Yep, and Wendy's talking about um, when family members come to help their relative eat and you already have those communal experiences happening. And I completely agree. I think we need to switch from sort of the leadership focus to the family focus. I think the leaders are going to have to be the ones who um, own sort of providing some resources to get it going and rolling. But I think that's the other piece for leaders to take away. This is happening informally. So as I have spent a lot of time in different institutional settings, it's happening in the kitchen area where family members are whispering to each other, getting coffees and things like that. So how do you open that up to support it? And as leaders, you don't even necessarily need to be there. Like I think your best counsel, your best peer support is when you're providing the resources and structure, um, but you don't have to necessarily be there, right? Because people don't necessarily even want those leaders in the room during family council, and that itself can be a barrier to having one. Okay, so we will wrap it up because we have people at the door checking their watches. Thank you, everybody who came. And I'll let Mary Lee touch the screen. Thanks, everybody online.